Good morning, my friends. I'm Pastor Stephen Brooks, and welcome today to our online internet around the world church service. And I am so happy that you are here today. And I believe that the Lord will bless you and strengthen you in your faith, and He will provide every need that you have because He is a great God. Hallelujah. Now, let's take our Bibles today and go to the book of Matthew, chapter 23, and let's go down to verse 23. So let's do a double, 23, 23, and we're going to receive the holy tithes and offerings. We're going to bring them into the storehouse of God so that the work of God doesn't struggle, doesn't just survive, but that the work of God thrives. Praise God, and we preach the gospel around the world. Now, Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. So he mentions the spices, that they were so particular in wanting to be observant to the law, to the letter of the law, that they tithe not just on their increase and on money and things like that. They tithe even on the spices that they had. For you pay tithe on, of mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. Those three things are throughout the law of God. And they were being neglected by the religious leaders. Now, Jesus says, these you ought to have done. In other words, justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. What's the other thing that he said, make sure that you don't leave that undone? Tithing even in the small areas. Praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you're going to grow some tomatoes in your own little vegetable garden, and you know, the, everybody seems like it, they like to grow tomatoes because it's kind of hard to mess it up because you can grow them in the wintertime. You can go to the, you know, go to the store and buy a little pot, put some potting soil in there and get a little vine and just give it some water every now and then. And you can have tomatoes all year long. But have you ever stopped to think that if you do that, 10% of those tomatoes need to go to the house of God? Well, Pastor Stephen, that's not money. It doesn't matter. 10%, the Bible says, of all of your increase belongs to the Lord, and you should pay a tithe on that. I remember years back, the famed evangelist, Brother R.W. Shambach, told the story of when he had just started off in ministry many, many years ago. Of course, Brother Shambach's in heaven now. But he was assigned a pastor, a small country church, and he taught on tithing. And he passed, a, you know, the tithing offering bucket around, and uh, it came back pretty much empty. And he said, Lord, um, I don't understand why... Uh, they're not getting it. What, 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 where am I missing it at? And so it's kind of like the Lord opened Brother Shambach's eyes to see. Because when he was teaching, they would kind of all sit there, kind of like real smug-like. All the, you know, members of the church while he's talking about, you know, you need to pay tithe. And when you get your check and, you, you know, your, you get your money from your job, you need to pay tithe. And they're all just sitting there with the look like that doesn't pertain to us. Oh, then he realized, oh, they're all farmers. In other words, they have their own farms. They grow their own vegetables. They don't get a paycheck. They're not, uh, you know, receiving money. So they thought, well, we're untouchable. So then he realized how he was supposed to minister that word to them. He said, those of you that raise chickens and, you know, your hens lay eggs, a tithe of those eggs belong to the Lord. And the moment he said that, suddenly everybody in the church set up. <laughs> and he knew, I've got them. I've been, I've been able to explain now the word in a way that is relevant to them. And he said, one of the big farmers there in the church, big old man, they called him Red, and he had red hair. He came up after the service and said, Preacher, are you telling me that if I bring the tithe of the eggs 
from my hens, my chickens, that then God will bless me? He said, that's exactly what I'm saying. He goes, well, he goes, my hens have not been laying, and I, I, I have not known what to have done about it. And Brother Shambach said, he said, that's because those hens aren't blessed, and that you sit sitting there stealing God's eggs. And if you bring the eggs into the storehouse, God will bless your chickens. And he said, Big Red looked at him and said, all right, I'm going to do it. This better work. And he went home that day and came back that afternoon and brought the, the tie that he had on currently on his eggs of what they had laid that morning and, you know, throughout that day. And it was hardly anything. I think maybe like two little crates of eggs, like 20 eggs or something like that. So um, he said, now I'm expecting this to work. And, you know, of course, Brother Shambach, you know, after he pre preached the message and told Brother Red that, he, he said, Lord, now, <laughs> Lord, you have to do your part <laughs> or else they're going to be really mad. So he said, Brother Red uh, came back next week and said, uh, Preacher, I want to bring my tithe. And he had the back of the pickup truck filled up with crates and crates and crates of eggs. He said, what'd you do? Go out and buy a whole bunch of chickens? He said, no, these are the same chickens, but they're now all laying eggs. Mm, mm, mm. These you ought to have done. What's that? Tithing on all of your increase, even if it's your spices that you grow in your own garden, because that's how they grew them back then. Okay. God says 10% of those spices belong to me. Pastor Stephen, I just grew some cantaloupe out in my backyard. Good. 10% of them belong to God. And if, even if I'm not your pastor and you're just watching this message because you enjoy the teaching, you need to, if, that's, if I'm talking to you, 10% uh, of those cantaloupes, you grew 10 cantaloupes, one of them, you need to be bringing that down to the house of God and say, man of God, woman of God, here's your cantaloupe. They may look at you funny and say, well, hey, it's not mine. It's God's. It's yours. Praise the Lord. The tithe belongs to the Lord. You pay tithe. Mm -mm. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So let's just have symmetry in our Christian life. Yes. Justice, mercy, faith. Yes. And also let's not, let's not skip the things also that we're supposed to do. I would even say required to do. Praise the Lord. Mm -mm. Well, Pastor Stephen, that was under the law. That was under the Mosaic system. Oh, so like grace gives you a free ride to just do whatever you want. You know what? The standard of the new covenant is way higher than the law. Now, I know we couldn't keep the law. The law was a teacher to show you that you have a sin problem. And the more you tried to work it out in the flesh or in your own works, it actually amplified your sin. And so the law accomplished its job. But there was nothing wrong with the law. It was holy. It was pure. But it was just a standard you couldn't reach. But see, here's the thing. Here's what's amazing about the new covenant. The new covenant is, is different, but it's even higher. Why? Well, with the law written on, you know, paper, written on scrolls and reading that and studying that, it focused Primarily external. Now, it did have the internal, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. But a lot of it also reflected your external way of living. But with the new covenant, now the Holy Spirit is living on the, on the inside of you. And even if it's not written in the letter of the law, and you just said something that hurt somebody's feelings, and the Holy Spirit... You can feel that grieve the Holy Spirit, and you know you need to go apologize to that person. Well, that's not written in the law that I need to do that, but it's written in the New Covenant. And in other words, the New Covenant is active 24-7. Mm. So trust me, if you, if you should pay tithe under the Old Covenant, you definitely should be paying tithe in the New Covenant. It's a higher standard. Hallelujah. Tithe, tithe on all of your increase. Woohoo! Hallelujah. Mm -mm. Pastor Stephen, I'm going to mail you a watermelon. I don't know, maybe turn it into dry fruit before it gets here. It might not make it, praise God. But that's not the point. The point is tithe. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, as you tithe, if you want to do so by mail, if you, that's the way that you prefer to bring it into the storehouse of the Lord, then send it to Stephen Brooks International, P.O. Box 717, Moravian Falls, North Carolina, 28654 is the zip code. Now, if you want to bring the tithe in online, no, no, you can't bring cucumbers and onions and watermelons in online. Well, we understand that. But uh, from a financial aspect, you know, you can. Hallelujah. Have a little garage sale, a little, put them out in the front of the house and sell them. Hallelujah. 
10% goes to the Lord. Now, those of you that like to go online and prefer to do that, to bring your tithes and offerings in, please visit the ministry website, stephenbrooks.org. There is a link on the homepage called Tithes and Offerings, Sow and Reap, and Honor the Lord with Matthew 23, 23, and tithe on every increase that comes through your hands or passes through your life, and you will be blessed. Woohoo! Lots of chickens, lots of eggs, lots of whatever is your thing that you know that you need. God will just multiply, addition, and then multiply and multiply. Say, I'm blessed because I know you are. Praise God. Now, Heavenly Father, bless your people. Let your increase flow, rush, into their lives. We thank you, Father God, that their days of insufficiency and lack, that's over. Father, I thank you that these are your covenant people, covenant through the blood of Jesus, and also tied to you through a righteous covenant of financial commitment through the holy tithe. And I thank you, O God, that you are rebuking the dirty devourer out of their lives, and the enemy cannot touch them or afflict them with any kind of calamity or disaster or setback. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. We all agree and say, Amen. Praise the Lord forever. Now, let us go today to the book of Ecclesiastes. And let's go to chapter 11. And let's talk about something fun today. It'll be fun, maybe a little sobering at the same time. Maybe some of you need that. Hallelujah. You can have fun and be sober, be responsible at the same time. We're going to go to Ecclesiastes, which is right after, for me, it's easy to think Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Okay? That's the way I think of how I get there the easiest. Praise God. We're going to talk today about rewards in heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that as we jump into your word, that as your word jumps into us, as we consume it as spiritual food, we pray that there would be revelation of that word, that it would make an effect within our lives that will bring you glory and that would conform us more into the image of Jesus as a mature believer. Father, we thank you. We thank you in the name of Jesus. We all agree and say, Amen. Now, Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 3, if the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. Ooh, glory to God. I really felt today before I brought this message to you while in prayer that for so many of you, your clouds are full from the seeds that you've sown. Yes, you're a tither. And at the same time, the tithe we know already belongs to the Lord. That's his. So you sow seed or give offerings. That way God can multiply the seed sown and bring harvest back into your life. But I know for so many of you as tithers and as givers, I know that your clouds are full. Well, Pastor Stephen, how do I know when I'm going to get a harvest? How do I know when I'm going to get rained on? Well, this is easy. When your clouds are full, they can't hold the moisture anymore and they just drop it. Woo, glory to God. And I'm here today to tell you as a servant of the Lord, as a minister of the gospel that I've heard from the Lord and your clouds are full and you really need to begin to rejoice because you will never know the financial challenges that you've had in previous years. That stuff is gone. That is a closed chapter of your life. You'll never taste that frustration ever again. Lift your hands and say, praise God. Mm -mm. Woo! Now, let's continue. Verse 3, if the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it shall lie. Have you ever seen a tree fall down? I'm not talking like a little bush. I've never seen it with that either, but I'm talking like a big tree. 20, 30,000 pound tree, 150 feet tall, fall. Have you ever seen it fall and then just say, nah, I don't like where I'm laying at. I'm going to get back up and I'm going to try that fall again. No, where it falls, whether it's going to the south or to the north, wherever it falls, my friends, it's game over. That's where it's going to lie. Now, trees 
so often throughout the Word of God can be used as a dual reference, not to just refer to a tree, although it certainly can refer to the tree, but you see a lot of symbolism uh, with trees mentioned in the Bible as in relation to people. Okay, so uh, you know, like a big, a big forest, a lot of trees represents a large amount of people, but a single tree would represent the individual. And you need to understand that when your life is over, I'm talking to believers, I'm not talking to unbelievers, although as unbelievers, please understand that when your life is over, your eternal destiny is sealed as well. It's not like you can go in the hell and say, you know what, I didn't know it was this painful. I didn't know I was going to be burning in pits of fire. I didn't know that I was going to be tormented and tortured in a place like this of agony and horror and terror and fear beyond human comprehension. I didn't know it was like this. I think I'd like to have a second chance. No, at that point, the judgment is set. Now, let me say this to the believers. Anything as far as making heaven, you know, whether you get to heaven with a whole bunch of rewards or you get to heaven, as it says in the scripture, by the skin of your teeth, you barely got in. I mean, maybe you heard the gospel just before you died and you got saved like the thief on the cross. Or maybe you were saved, but you lived your entire life in such a way uh, where you didn't really know about the things of God, maybe you weren't taught, maybe you weren't introduced to it, and you just kind of rambled through life, but yet you were saved, but you got to heaven still by the skin of your teeth. Well, my friends, let me say this. That's, that's, it sure beats going to hell. <laughs> so anything is better than the place of eternal damnation. Now, those that go into hell, those that, who rejected Christ, the sinners who did not receive Christ as their Lord and Savior, they go into hell and they are tortured. They suffer unspeak unspeakable agonies and they are kept in hell. And by the way, hell is in the center of the earth. Okay. They are kept there until the day of the great judgment known in scripture as the white throne judgment. Then they are brought out of that place one by one. They go before God and they are judged by God and their life is reviewed with their sin, their rejection of Christ, all of the opportunities, all of the opportunities they had to repent and receive Christ where they rejected over and over and over. And then they are after the judgment when their final judgment is given and the judgment's already set because they've already been in hell. But after it's reviewed and it's officially stamped and sealed, so to speak, then they are thrown into the eternal, their final eternal place, which is called the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. And it is not metaphorical. It is not uh, symbolism. It is a real literal place. Now, I have been taken by the Lord in a vision into hell. I have never seen the lake of fire, but what I saw in hell, the horrors and the torment and the awful things done to the people that are there is um, frightening. But the worst thing lies ahead for those who have rejected Christ. It is the lake of fire. And it says that Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire. His day's coming. He knows that. The Antichrist, the beast, and the false prophet, they will also be thrown into the lake of fire. And death and hell itself will also be thrown into the lake of fire. Now, hell is... In the center of the earth, in the form of a body, it actually looks like a body. It has a head, uh, a torso, legs, uh, and arms. And people are th that who have not received Christ when they die, they're coming into hell. Hell is just being filled all the time with an uh, with, uh, incredible amount of people that when they die, they go into hell because they never knew Christ. But even as there is an evil body of hell, that body of hell will eventually be thrown into the lake of fire itself. Death and hell, which are spirits, they will both be thrown into the lake of fire. Praise God. And then at that point, 
we go into eternity because now the millennium's also over and you know Satan had a heyday at the end of the millennium or the thousand year reign of Christ he pops out for a short period of time uh, I do believe that that short period of time that he's going to run wild one final time try to raise up a war overthrow God one final silly time He'll probably have about three and a half years to pull that off or give it a shot. Of course, he's not going to pull it off. He's going to be annihilated and thrown into the lake of fire. And finally, we're done with him forever. Okay. So we have to understand that the way that you live your life here upon this earth is very, very important. Now, of course, yes, you want to live for the Lord. You want to make heaven. That's, that's the greatest thing. And let me say this. The greatest decision that you ever made in your life was not to go to college was not to learn Greek, was not to um, try a different food. The greatest decision you ever made in your life was to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior because that was the moment you received His eternal life into your spirit. You, you were, in other words, born again, recreated on the inside, regenerated as it's uh, expressed in the Greek of the New Testament. You are regenerated with the life of God, and now you belong to the Lord. So you have already made that amazing decision. By the way, if you haven't, please continue to listen, and I'll give you an opportunity to make that decision as well here in just a moment. But my friends, as believers, we must make our life count. Now, I want to read just a few sentences to you that a pastor uh, was told by an angel that came and visited him. And this uh, story is actually in the book Angels on Assignment, which is the uh, recording of the angelic visitations that Pastor Roland Buck had. Okay, the book's on the internet. You can find it out there. It's probably, uh, it's actually, you don't have to buy it. It's on, it's on the internet, and you can just download it as a PDF file, or there's all kinds of sites where you can read it if you want to. But the minister that I'm referring to uh, is actually not Mr. Roland Buck, but it was a minister that Mr. Buck knew. And this pastor that he knew shared the story, what this angel told him. And I just want to read you a few sentences, and we want to talk about some of these things today. Now, this is what the angel told this pastor. He said, God gives you alternatives and allows you to make choices. You can choose to be close to Him, or you can go your own way, do your own thing, and live a selfish life. Now, I know... I'm not talking to any Christians who would ever live a selfish life. Well, uh, uh, you, maybe we've met some, but I'm sure I'm not speaking to anybody who would uh, uh, do that. But just in case, somewhere out there in the gigantic Internet world, there would be a Christian who would say, well, Pastor Stephen, maybe I'm living a little bit like that, a little bit too much self. Uh, keep talking. Okay, let me keep on talking. Let me read it again. The angel told the pastor, God gives you alternatives and allows you to make choices. You can choose to be close to him or you can go your own way, do your own thing and live a selfish life. But my friends, here's what you have to understand that if you do that, if you live that selfish life and live the life the way you want to, regardless of what God wants you to do, you're just not going to go for it. Um, you will get to heaven and you're going to want to kick yourself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you're going to, going to, you're going to, now I know you're in heaven. So you, you, you know, you're, you're going to be happy, but I don't want you to be the person, the believer that gets to heaven. And then you realize what you could have had. Okay. I'm here today to persuade you to live your life all out for the Lord, because when you get there, and you see what it's all about, the glory and the rewards. It's not like you can suddenly go, oh, Lord, I didn't know. Let me go back and redo it again. No, no, no. If a tree falls to the south or the north in the place where the tree falls, there it shall lie. And that is your inheritance that you see. And you don't want to go to heaven without there being inheritance awaiting you. Glory to God. Mm -hmm. 
what you do here, my friends, as a child of God on the earth affects the rewards and even the position that you receive and are granted in heaven. You know, I think about the time that years back, Prophet Kenneth Hagin told about the vision he had of when Jesus came to him with this incredible crown. I mean, a crown. Look, I've seen the, the what are they called? The, you know, the, the, the place there in, in England, in London, where they keep all the royal jewels at. And I've seen the crowns, the mitres, the scepters that the king and the queen use, the ones you've probably seen on the, you know, whenever there's a coronation or something like that. I've seen all of that stuff. Stood just a few feet or inches in front of it, looked at it. Look, there's crowns in heaven that, that make that stuff look like tinfoil. There are crowns in heaven, and there are things that God has to place upon his people that you could, you could never fabricate or create on, the, create on this earth with any of the materials that are here. There are heavenly glories and rewards. And Brother Hagin said that Jesus had this crown, and it was, I mean, it was just beautiful. And he said, Lord, what, you know, what is that? What type of crown is that? And the Lord said, this is a soul winner's crown. But the Lord said, yet so many of my people are not interested in souls. They don't even think about it. They're just living their lives for themselves. Oh, trying to be a good Christian in a sense like, let's not go out and rob or steal or murder anybody. But, you know, we still, we're going to do our own thing. We want, we want to live the life the way we want to. And souls are the last thing on their mind. But my friends, God wants to get you ready. God wants to get you ready, praise the Lord, for eternity. And there are ministries in heaven, not like in a ministry of an evangelist, you, you don't need that, everybody's saved. Not like you need a word of knowledge, because all the knowledge is already, you know, there. It's not like we need prophecy, it's like, hey, we got all eternity, you know, <laughs> and so, and, and so uh, we understand it from that perspective, but, but, even Jesus looked at the 12 apostles and said, you know, because you've been with me through all my trials and difficulties, when I, when I rule and reign on the earth, each one of you will be over the 12 tribes of Israel. In other words, somebody, maybe Peter, is going to be like over uh, Judah, and uh, then you got, you got the next apostle, maybe he's going to be over, you know, Reuben or Levi or Simeon, and so they're, the 12 are going to be ruling the 12 tribes, and Jesus is Lord over all the earth, and David will be king over Israel. My friends, those are rewards for faithfulness, but there will be those also who are assigned, even during the millennium reign, the 1,000-year reign of Christ, there will be those who are faithful, not goofballs who just, you know, got into heaven. Hallelujah, Lord, I made it. Put my faith and trust you. I'm glad I'm here. And it is wonderful. God loves you just as much. God loves you just as much. But obedience is what's pleasing to the Lord. So you can love all of your children the same, but you can have some that are more obedient. And it's the obedient ones that please you, and because of their obedience, they qualify for things that the others who are not obedient uh, do not qualify for. Mm -mm. So yes, there will be uh, nations to reign over and things like that. It's going to be very interesting. And not only during the millennial reign, but of course, it's a big universe. It's a big universe, and uh, all of these star systems and planets and galaxies. And no, there won't be procreating, you know, like husband and wife. There won't be, uh, you know, the creating of children or things like that. But there will still be governance, uh, and there will still be oversight that will be given to those who were faithful. So there is a lot to gain. Now, I received a, a real wake up call. When I was a senior in high school, and it was graduation day. You know what? It may seem a little bit surreal, and it may seem difficult to visualize it. But one day, your life, just like everybody else's who's ever lived on planet Earth for the last 6,000 years, one day your life will be over, and you will 
stand before the Lord, not at the white throne judgment. That's for the sinners. But you will stand before the Lord, and there will be a review of your life, and the way that you live for the Lord, that will all be weighed and examined and observed and things like that, your obedience and all those things. And it will be reviewed, and that's when the correct reward assessment will be made, and then it will be distributed to you. Well, when I was a senior in high school on graduation day, they took all of the seniors, including myself, into the basketball gymnasium, and we all sat down on the left side of the bleachers. We're all filled up the bleachers, okay? And so the principal, he, uh, he comes out into the middle of the basketball court with a, you know, a uh, audio speaker system, and he's talking, and he goes, well... It's been a wonderful four years, and, um, and it's been a great time, but all, all good things have to come to an end. Uh, you know, at least in heaven they don't, right? But uh, here on earth, he said, well, you know, this is your last day in high school, so it is now time. Watch this. He said, it's now time for the rewards. And I, th I thought, the what? <laughs> uh, well, what did he say? I, I kind of elbowed my friend. Now, what did he just say? He goes, the rewards. I thought, rewards for what? Oh, well, th there were quite a few people in the, in the graduating group. They knew what it was exactly about. Ah, ah. Maybe I didn't get it all pulled together in high school. But let me tell you what. And I'm going to share a little bit about this. By the time the award ceremony was over, I said, Lord, I don't know how, but when it comes to living for you, I'm never going to let this happen again. Why? What do you mean, Pastor Stephen? Well, the principal began to call out the, the awards for our graduating class. The mathematic award goes to uh, so-and-so. Hey, give him a hand. Woo! Mm, here's your reward. Now get over to the other side. Okay, so he gets his reward paper. He goes to the other side. Now we want to give out the science award. Uh, you, yes, yes, you're the golden recipient. Come forward. And the person comes forward, gets the award, crosses to the other side. Well, they, you know, he, he's giving out these uh, awards. A lot of it was based on GPA. Uh, and I thought, you mean they've been keeping track? <laughs> yeah, yeah they, they were keeping track all the time that, you know, you slept through class or didn't do your homework or thought, oh, what's the big deal? Yep, they were keeping track of all of that. And so are the angels right now. And what I'm trying to get over you today is a lot more important than your uh, valedictorian or salutatorian or GPA could ever be. And I'm not saying that's irrelevant. That, that's, that is honorable. But that's, that's, um, that's not going to be the focus when you stand before the Lord. Mm -hmm. I mean, him might say, hey, that's great that you graduated the valedictorian. Now, let's get back to the real issues of life. Okay. So, my friends, all of these awards were given out, given out. And, you know, before we knew it, more people are starting to get over to the right side than those of us that are still left sitting around on the left side who never really understood what it was all about. Praise God. So, when it was finally all over, the principal said, well, let's give them all a good hand over here. <laughs> okay, it's been a great year. Goodbye. And that was it. They all rolled off with their uh, rewards, not into eternity, but into adulthood. And uh, the rest of us just looked at each other and uh, we thought, well, hmm, that was nice. That was nice, but we didn't really get anything. And no, we didn't. But I just, I remembered that and I said, Lord, it won't be like that for me spiritually. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now watch this. Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And I know that you do, okay? You must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder. Mm -mm. A rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, during this lifetime, which you only get one go at it, okay? During this lifetime, if you will consistently give God your best, He will give you His best. And that's the way the Lord works. If you really seek Him, He's going to reward you, and He's going to bless you. 
praise God. But you need to really push yourself sometimes. See, those who seek diligently, diligently. I remember the prophet Walter Butler. He talked about the time where he began to seek the Lord, getting up at 2.30 in the morning. I mean, how many people, honestly, in the church do stuff like that? Get up at 2.30 in the morning. Oh, Pastor Stephen, he didn't have to go to work at 8. Yes, he did, too. He had to be at work at 8 o'clock in the morning. But he just had a hunger for God, and he began to get up at 2.30 in the morning to seek the Lord. Well, Pastor Stephen, how can anybody ever do that and still get the sleep they need? I don't know. You just have to figure it out. It's just a matter of hunger. It's a matter of do you want the Lord, and, you know, just, you, you'll find room for the sleep, okay? Maybe you get an hour at lunch or 45 minutes. Go out and eat your, your sandwich real quick in the car, then lean back, fall asleep. Set your alarm, wake up in 45 minutes, go back to work. You, know, you can figure a way out. Praise God. But this seeking the Lord business diligently is very, very serious stuff. So Brother Butler began to seek the Lord 2.30 every morning. Sometimes he'd stay up for an hour, then go back to bed. Sometimes for two hours, then go back to bed. Sometimes when the Spirit of the Lord was real strong, he'd just stay up until 7 and then get some coffee and get, you know, get a shower, get shaved, and get ready to go to work. Uh, and the Lord would just help him get through it. Praise God. But after having done this for months, he did kind of wonder, Lord, where are you? In the sense where I, I felt your presence, but... You know, Lord, I'm, uh, I'm really pushing here, and it's not like this is a cakewalk. <laughs> and it's not like it, this is legalistic either. It's just being done out of love. But Lord, I love you, I, I, and I'm seeking you. It, it, says, it says you will reward those who diligently seek you. So, Lord, perhaps you could give me a little more insight on this. So he kept on seeking, kept on seeking. And it was shortly after that where one morning, at about 2.30 or 3 in the morning as he was sitting in his little chair. He always got up out of bed, went to a certain room in the house, uh, in the, like in the living room where it was real quiet. He was sitting in that chair and just fellowship, worship the Lord, pray in the Spirit. And he said one day while he was, one morning while he was sitting in the chair, um, he sensed, he didn't turn around and look, but he sensed the Lord walked into the room, was standing behind him, and kind of leaning over him a little bit, and the Lord was weeping and crying. And the, he knew, Brother Butler knew by the Holy Spirit, that the Lord was so touched that somebody would get out of bed in the middle of the night and push through that discomfort out of love to seek him in the middle of the night that the Lord stood over him and wept and cried and the hot tears ran down the Lord's face and dripped on top of brother Butler's head. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Hallelujah. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Pastor Stephen, now I'm convinced that when I get to heaven, I'm really going to be near to the Lord. We all will be. Your flesh won't bother you. You'll be out of your flesh. And even when you get your new resurrected fleshly body and you're able to be clothed in it, it will be an immortal body with literally superhuman ability. So it's not like you really have to push then. All, all of this is going on now. The making of a saint. I'm talking about you. It's all going on now. That's what the Lord wants to do. Mm. The Father wants to mold you into the image of His dear Son. Don't be afraid to push yourself. Praise God. Mm -mm. Because there is coming the day when the rewards are going to be handed out. Watch this. You're going to have a whole bunch of Christians that are in heaven. Oh, yes. Washed with the blood of Jesus. Uh, saved. Happy to be there. But when they start to see the rewards that are going to be handed out for those that diligently served the Lord and honored the Lord and obeyed the Lord and laid their lives down for the Lord, they're going to step back and say, oh, I, I didn't know. <laughs> and you're going to say, I knew. I knew the whole time. Hallelujah. And I'm ready for something to be given to me today. Mm -hmm. Woo! I knew it the whole time. And you live your life for the Lord now. Mm, thank you, Jesus. Praise God. One time I was in 
India, in northern India, in the area of Kalimpong. And, uh, you know, really, if you didn't know that you flew into India, you would actually, uh, just by looking, you would think you were in Tibet, because you're pretty close to the uh, China-Tibet area, and many of the people there are uh, Tibetan or Nepalese, and beautiful people with the most beautiful clothing, probably some of the most beautiful clothing I've ever seen in the world, where colors that are iridescent and fluorescent, or what we would call like hot colors, that's normal for them. And it's just, just amazing, amazing colors. And so I remember that I went there and uh, hosted by a wonderful man of God, and we were doing meetings and really endeavoring to break through with the anointing as we were ministering to about 400 young people. And God was moving. God, God was doing good things, but we did not yet have in the meetings what we would call like breakthrough revival. So, you know, up until that point, you just do the best you can. You still minister the word, you still pray for people. Yes, you see some good things happen, but it wasn't like, you know, we're just swimming in the glory. So we kept pushing. And I remember one night after I finished preaching, they took me back to the area where they would feed the ministers, and they had gotten me a pizza way up there in the mountains. I don't know where they got it. I don't know who made it. I don't know how it got there, but they had gotten me a pizza, and they, they, knew, uh, they knew I loved pizza, and they all wanted to see me eat it. So uh, the ministers were eating uh, but because they had rounded up a pizza, they knew Stephen Brooks liked pizza. Many others came in uh, because they all wanted to see me eat it. They wanted to they wanted to see my reaction, and so I ate it with the first bite. I bit into it, and they're all looking at me. And I understand laws of honor. I understand that when you give something to somebody. You really are looking for a reaction. A smile would be nice. Hallelujah. A thank you would be greatly appreciated. And so they're looking for that. And I know that's, that's just what we, we do. We show honor. But I have to be honest. When I bit into that pizza, it tasted like a piece of cardboard. I mean, I literally could have taken pages out of this notepad and started eating it. And it probably would have tasted almost like that. I'm not trying to be mean. And I didn't tell them that because I smiled. Mm -mm. And they looked at me. They felt satisfied by my look. And I, but I'm forcing it down. And it literally did taste like cardboard. But I, uh, uh, Pastor Stephen, how is it? Do you like it? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Very feeling. Mm -mm. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Mm. Oh, Pastor Stephen, have another slice. Eat it all. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Mm, down it goes. Down it goes. Down it goes. And smiling while I ate it. But it tasted really bad. Tasted really bad. Well, the meetings continue. The meetings continued. And um, the next morning, somebody ministers. Great message. Next afternoon, somebody ministers. Great message. And another day goes by. Still didn't get that breakthrough. But one night after that. Um, during the day, the Holy Spirit gave me, I mean, he told me what the message was. He said, he literally told me, speak on this when you go, and I'm going to back it with power. So I went into the meeting already knowing before anything happens, this is it. This is what we've been looking for, because this is not just a message. This is what God says, and it was the word of the Lord. So I went into that meeting, and as soon as I began speaking the message, the Holy Spirit fell. He fell on the people. He fell on my translator. The first person went out was my translator. <laughs> and then he began falling on all, all the adults. And then he started hitting all the teens and, uh, all, and then the children. And it did not stop uh, until about 4 o'clock in the morning. The power uh, was, I mean, it, it didn't matter where you were at. If you are in a bathroom, you got laid out. If you were in the auditorium, you got laid out by God. If you were in the hallway, you got laid out. It, uh, the Spirit of God was moving into tremendous power. Great time. The, the host said, he said, in my many years of ministry, that's probably the most drunken service I've ever seen. Drunk in the Spirit, you understand. Very different from drunk in the world, drunk on wine. Um, but that night, 
after that message was over. It was about 10 o'clock. Now, God's still moving, but they thought we need to feed, you know, the ministers. So they take us back. Oh, oh, they've got something for Pastor Stephen. Now, see, I had spent the entire day on my knees. I don't know how long I prayed, maybe eight or ten hours. I'm not saying that to say I'm holy. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you have, there's times you have to push. Why? We're living for eternity. And it's not like sometimes you can fly to these places halfway around the world. Oh, that's easy. I'll be back next week. Oh, the, these, the, it'll take you a week just to recover from the jet lag. The, this is stuff that you go into it. You lay your life down. You, you, well, you serve the Lord, and it's your time. You, you put your whole heart into it. And I had. So we go back. Who? Who? They had another pizza for Pastor Stephen. Pastor Stephen, we have another pizza. I smiled. I thought about the first one, but I smiled. You know, I, I thought, take courage. We'll get it down again. But this one, when they opened the lid of the box, uh, I, I mean, this 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 pizza was beyond Domino's, beyond Papa John's, beyond Pizza Hut. This this was like something like an angel had just brought. From a kitchen in heaven. It, was, it looked like a, like a supernatural pizza. And they were all smiled. And nobody knew where it came from. Nobody knew who made it. Who got it there. It just showed up hot. And this was the pizza for Pastor Steve. <laughs> and the other, the other ministers didn't want pizza. They just wanted rice and soy sauce or whatever was making them happy. So the, the pizza was all mine. And all eyes came in. People came in. And they were watching. They're, they're looking for the reaction. And I put that first slice and that first bite into my mouth. And it was beyond anything you could make on the earth. It was like a pizza, literally, that was brought from heaven by an angel. It was absolutely incredible. Uh, and they said, Pastor Stephen, it's good. And I said, oh, praise the Lord. Mm -mm. And, you know, they're half, you know, toasted in the spirit. Oh, Pastor, you know, we're just having the most hilarious times and uh, having a good time in the Lord. But see, when you give God your best, then and only then will he release his best to you. Mm -mm. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. My friends, give God your best during this life. Serve Him with all of your heart. You have distractions all around you. You have entertainment and sources for recreation unlike any other generation ever that has lived on the earth in the history of the world. Don't let these things rob your focus or steal your devotion away from the Lord. Can I tell you a funny story? When I was uh, up there in that northern part of India, it was very cold, high elevation, and cold 365 days of a year. We actually flew over, no, excuse me, not over. Uh, you're not technically, I don't think, allowed to fly over them, but kind of close by them from the side because the pilot said, look out the window, there's the Himalayan mountains. And so we're real close. This is all mountains, snow-capped, and so that's where we were at. So it was cold all the time. And I was wearing like five, four or five layers of clothing, and I was still cold all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a travel companion, praise the Lord. Uh, Kelly was not able to make it on that trip with me, so I had a wonderful travel companion. I uh, flew all the way from Moravian Falls, and uh, we, you know, got there. But bless his heart, he was, a, he was a big man, and he had some extra insulation. So he wasn't struggling with the cold like I was, because um, uh, I just you don't really have any reserves to help keep me warm. So I was cold all the time. But, you know, he was around me throughout all of those meetings, and um, he was a real blessing. He had, a, I don't know, had, he had the most amazing ability to look at a menu written in a foreign language and somehow figure out what to pick to eat, because he would order his food, my, my food, we both eat some of the same things, maybe a few varieties to change it up. And he was, he could just order, like, I don't have phenomenal ability to order food really good in a language you can't even read. I mean, it was just, even, even the, the writing, can't even understand what it means, but he could look at it somehow and figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> that was his anointing. Praise God. But one night in the hotel room in which we were staying, 
uh, with very, very limited electricity and so forth. Very modest, but still very, very nice. We really enjoyed it. It was very cold in the room. Um, it was just too cold. The heater couldn't keep up with it. A little bitty heater couldn't keep up with it. It was cold all the time. But I found a way to get warm. And in the morning, uh, this dear brother, he saw me. He's a businessman. He saw me. He said, he said, Stephen, now I know, despite the miracles that I've seen you work, and God worked through you. He said, now I know that you are a holy man of God. I said, now, brother, I said, now, what, what in the world would make you say something like that? He said, you didn't know it. But I was in the other room asleep, and I got up in the middle of the night to check on you because it was so cold, and I knew it was difficult for you. And he said, despite the freezing temperature, even in the room, I saw you laying on the bed with nothing but a little thin, like, skimpy little blanket laid over you and yet you were you were just laying there you were you looked so warm your face was red your legs were red and I just said Lord he is a holy man you even supernaturally keep him warm with a nothing but a little bitty blanket on him in these freezing temperatures I said God he's a holy man hmm <laughs> I said, brother, I said, um, I just started laughing. I said, did you not, did you not find the electric blanket in your room? <laughs> he said, what? <laughs> I said, I said, you know, there by your bed, there's that little drawer. If you'd have pulled it open, there's an electric, electric blanket. You can take it out. Yes, it's real thin. But I said, I had mine on all night. I was getting so hot. I felt like I was about to burn up. <laughs> he said, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. See, serving the Lord also causes revelation to come to you that could be hidden mysteries that perhaps pass by others. I don't know. Hallelujah. That's just having a little bit of fun. We had a lot of fun. I believe the Lord wants us to enjoy life as we're serving him. Yes, sometimes you'll have to push maybe harder than what you thought, but God's in it and the reward, trust me, will be there. It will be there. Let's go deeper. First Timothy. Chapter four. And let's drop down to verse eight. For bodily exercise profits a little. Now it doesn't say it's worthless. Some translation says it has some value. I like that. Okay. But all in all, in the eyes of God, it's on the lower end of the, uh, it's on the way lower end of the priority list. Oh, Pastor Stephen, that, I'm glad to hear you say that because I just really, you know, I love candy bars and I love soda. Now, now look, I'm not saying wreck your system or abuse your system either. That's not what I'm saying. There, there needs to be balance. All I am trying to say, though, is that in our culture, that puts a tremendous weight on appearance and really showing things off, whether it's a man or a woman, um, that stuff can really distract you from living the life God wants you to. Let me explain. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. The thing about bodily exercise is that it takes so much work to carve and to shape and sculpt and to develop. And guess what? Once you've got it there, which I know many of you know what I'm talking about. Once you've got it there, it takes a lot of work to maintain it. Woo. And if you don't maintain it, sometimes for just three or five days, you notice within that short amount of time, it starts to go downhill. Hmm. Maybe you remember Arnold Schwarzenegger back in the 70s with that classic movie called Pumping Iron with the theme song. 
Everybody wants to live forever. You know, the song kind of re would repeat those words. Everybody wants to live forever. Pumping iron and, you know, all these guys that look like they're carved out of granite, uh, you know, working out for six hours a day. And, uh, you know, all, also, as we now know, having a lot of artificial stimulation. Hint, hint, steroids, if you know what I'm talking about. In case you didn't know, no, that's not normal. You can't look like that unless you're juiced. And I'm not talking about fruit juice. But my friends, the fact of the matter is, it takes a lot to get into that. Well, Pastor Stephen, how does Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, Schwarzenegger look today? Well, he doesn't look anything like that. Why? Because you cannot maintain it. And eventually... Eventually, you might as well face it, it's all going to go south anyhow. Now, I'm not saying just let yourself go. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying this, that life is very short, very temporal. And you can get caught up in things and you think it's all this. And it just takes a lot of energy, a lot of effort. And, uh, whoo. And then if you ever do get there where people applaud you and say, oh, yeah, hey, I want to look like that guy. Well, the guy that looks like that, he's running day and night trying to maintain that. And, it, uh, you know, now, every, now he lives his life by what he can eat, what he can eat, what, what his calorie intake is, what he's not allowed to eat. And just on and on it goes, drinking shakes all the time, and it just starts to consume your life. Be careful with these types of things. Be careful with these types of things. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Many things. Pastor Stephen, I'm going to modify my vehicle. Okay, well, you're going to have a hard time selling it. If it's not stock, you got all this stuff that you did. First of all, you're never going to get that when you sell it. You're never going to get that out of the sale when you sell it. And um, it's just, it never stops with one thing. I'm going to modify the tires. I'm going to modify the engine air intake. I'm going to modify the engine chip. And that way I can upgrade it with more horsepower. That, uh, that now, well, now you've got to up, upgrade the transmission shaft because it can't handle all that horsepower. Now you've got to change this out. Change that out. I'm going to upgrade the stereo system. I don't like the stock system. And the, now you know it. You're just working on this stuff all the time. All the time. All the time. And you've only got one life. One go at this. I know a man of God. Mm. Good man of God. When he's on, he's on. Mm. He can, he's a good soul winner, good evangelist. We got caught up in this car thing. And uh, it was a hobby. And I, I don't think there's anything wrong, wrong with a hobby. But a lot of times people, they take these hobbies and then they just, uh, it starts to grab them over something. Next thing you know, they got hobby fever, gold fever, hot rod fever, workout fever, whatever it is, investment fever, what, on and on it goes. And um, he just, uh, he got this uh, hot rod and he started working on it. And, you know, people would say, wow, that, that's cool. Every time we take it out, get all these accolades and stuff like that. And it just began to eat his time up, eat his time up. One time he got fed up with it. He just got fed up with it and sold it, got rid of the stupid thing. Why? It was a distraction for him, and especially as a man of God. I'm not saying as a man of God you can't have some, you know, your hobbies and your recreation and, and things like that. I'm just saying that for a lot of people, we've never had access to recreation ever like we have. I mean, it's everywhere. It's everywhere in all types of formats with all of the new technology of being able to stream and download Thousands, literally tens of thousands of movies. Well, I never saw those movies that came out in the 90s. I need to go back and rewatch all of those for the, or watch them for the first time. I'd like to go back to the 80s. You know what? I need to watch that whole Star Wars series all over again so I can understand what's going on in the end one. And, you know, it just on and on it goes. Oh, now we need to watch this series so we can better understand pop culture and what happens there. And it's never ending. It's never ending. And you can get lost in this fog. You can get lost in this fog of just living like this. And then you wake up and you're 85 years old and life's almost over. Or 
It ends unexpectedly because the Lord is coming back as a thief in the night. And then there is the catching up of the church out of the earth. Oh, Lord, I, I, didn't, I didn't know I wasn't right. Well, it doesn't matter. When he's coming, he's coming to take you back. And when Jesus comes back, he's not coming to check your theological eschatology. Well, I'm pre-trib. I'm mid-trib. I'm post-tribulation. He's not concerned about that. When he comes back to take the church, as long as you're living, he's living in your heart, he's taking you up, taking you out. Praise the Lord. Mm -mm. And the body of Christ is not appointed unto wrath. Jesus has deliverance on his mind for you. And only the Father knows that date. But we're getting closer. Mm -mm. He'll come like a thief in the night. You need to be ready. Need to be ready. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I did. Uh, I've shared this story before, but let me share it again. I talked to my treasurer when I was the chapter president of a full gospel businessman's fellowship international chapter. Now, it's a organiz Christian businessman's organization that's known all over the world. The thing that was special is that I was chapter president of the chapter that met in Irvine, California, where the world headquarters was at. And so whenever a lot of these super successful Christian businessmen would fly into the world headquarters, well, they would let me know. And that way I could get them to come over to speak during my midweek uh, uh, Wednesday luncheon meeting. And so we had phenomenal people share but after the meetings were over, after there were salvations, after there were divine healings of the Lord touching people and the wonderful times we had, I would sometimes sit around with my treasurer. He was an old man, and he'd lived a good life. And his wife, Maya, uh, who, you know, husband and wife, they loved each other, and she was a prophetess of the Lord and was greatly used by the Lord. Really, when Demas Shakarian, the founder of Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International, when he would have those meetings and he really needed to hear from the Lord, he would always go looking for her. Maya had many supernatural encounters. Now, Henry and Maya are both in heaven now. They, they lived their lives out. But because Maya had had these experiences with the Lord, these visions, I would, you know, ask her, I'd like interview her in a sense, one-on-one, -on -one, like, I mean, me and Kelly would sit at the table after the meetings are over and everybody's left and we're still talking about heaven. And she'd tell me stories of things that had happened to her. She told me about the time she went to heaven and Jesus allowed her to meet, uh, not meet really, but to catch back up with her daddy who had died uh, like a couple of decades earlier. And she knew that he was in heaven because he was a Christian, but Jesus allowed her to spend uh, a couple of hours in heaven with him. She was caught up in a vision. So she goes to heaven, sees the Lord. The Lord allows her to go spend time with her father in heaven. And so he takes her to his home. And, you know, they talk and uh, he tells her about, you know, the wonders of heaven. And then she's later going to be given a tour and stuff. But she asked her father a question she said daddy it's wonderful to see you and to have this blessed privilege of the Lord to be allowed to have this these short moments with you but she said I, I have to ask you a question while here I I can't help but notice some of these mansions and there's mansions all over the place she was explaining uh, but she said there are some that are just phenomenal beyond comprehension and she told her daddy th th there's so many beautiful mansions but she said why do you live in what you're living in now she described what he was living in as more like a like a condo it was like a like a really nice apartment I wouldn't call it an apartment because they don't really have those in heaven but it was like a very nice condo very nice she said how come all of these other people have you know, mansions, but yet you have this. And there's others that had places like he had. How come you have a, like this little bitty place? He goes, well, Maya, he said, I never told you this while I was on the earth. 
But when I was on the earth for years and years and years, the Lord endeavored to call me into the ministry. And he called me to be a preacher. And I always resisted that call. I wanted to do my own thing in life. I didn't want to be a preacher. And so I put the Lord off and put him off and just never answered that calling. And although I knew the Lord is my Savior, I was disobedient and I lived my life unto myself. That's why I don't have a mansion like others have. That's why I'm in this little bitty condo, because I never answered the call to ministry. Mm. Oh, by the way, she told me that the little dog that she grew up with, the family dog, was there running around uh, the condo having a wonderful time. Yes, if you want your precious pet to be with you in heaven, uh, that pet will be there in heaven. I was taken to heaven one time. Many of you have read my testimony about this. And I was allowed to see the mansion that the Lord had for me. It was actually like me and Kelly's mansion. It was both of our mansion. I just knew that we both were going to live there. Okay. And so I was allowed to go into my mansion and I saw my precious uh, Airedale Terrier dog. There she was. Her name was Tabitha sleeping on a beautiful rug in the living room of my heavenly mansion. There was a fireplace. There was a fire going. <laughs> Glory. Hallelujah. My dog had a golden collar. She never had this on earth, but she had a golden collar around her neck with uh, it, it was 24 karat solid gold. And it said Tabitha Brooks engraved in cursive writing. It was absolutely beautiful. Hallelujah. My friends, there are so many different types of rewards. And I believe that the Lord wants you to have a soul winner's crown. That's why. In this ministry, we do all we can to build up the church and to reach the lost. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Because we want a soul winner's crown. And then when we win them to the Lord, we want to disciple them. Because Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. Make disciples. And that's what we're doing. Hallelujah. Thank you for standing with us as together we are living not just for this life. We are living for eternity. We have eternity in mind. We want to bring as many to the Lord as we possibly can. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I would ask you to be mindful of those that God places within your arena of life. Those that you can speak to that are going through things. You know, there was a, a man in my church years back, a good man. He loved the Lord, but he would be a classic example of somebody that loved the Lord, but he was just dry. He was dry spiritually because he wanted to live life his way. And because of that, although he was saved, that rich heavenly life was not flowing into him. And he could be very insensitive sometimes. Um, he had a fellow that worked with him just a few feet away from him that worked with him. Now, I had to go to his job one time because of the type of work he had. I won't name what that was. But I had to go to his job site one time to see him because he was taking care of something that I needed fixed. And so while I was there... Uh, I could see this other young man that worked there. The young man was a very troubled young man. And he was all, that young man was like wild. He was blasting music real loud, real repulsive music. And he was just hard to get along with. He, the young man was insensitive, didn't care if the music bothered other people. And my church member said, this guy drives, he told me quite, kind of quietly. He said, this guy just drives me nuts. I can't stand him. He does all of this every day. And I said, have you ever witnessed to him? I said, he needs the Lord. He goes, ah, he's not interested in the things of God. I said, have you asked him? Have you talked to him about the Lord? Ah, no, I'm not even going to waste my time with him. And 
A few weeks later, that young man killed himself and committed suicide. And nobody ever told him about the gospel that we know of. And that Christian working next to him every day, every day, every day, every day, seeing his trouble, seeing his, his acting out all of this pain because of the turmoil in his life, never once told him about the Lord. Mm. Praise the Lord. My friends, let's be sensitive and not have our heads wrapped up in all kinds of things of the world so deeply that we can't even see spiritually the need that would be right in front of us. Oh, I know sometimes it can interrupt us. Sometimes when the last thing we want to do is mention Jesus or, or be spiritual. I remember one time I was in Jerusalem, Israel, having finished a large conference. I was tired physically. I felt depleted. I ministered a lot. Not just preaching, teaching, but praying over people, hundreds of people, and just uh, pouring myself out. The meeting's over. I thought, now I can relax. I said, Kelly, let's go find a good coffee house somewhere. So we went to the Jerusalem bus stop, just looking around, because we were real close by. We were at the Crown Plaza Hotel. And we walked to the Jerusalem bus stop and saw a, a good, looked like a good coffee place, so we went in. And I went and I sat down. Kelly went and ordered our two lattes, one for her, one for me. Well, I'm tired just sitting there, kind of being low profile, sitting in a corner, a little round table, waiting for Kelly to come join me with the, with the coffee drinks. And Kelly came back to the table, and she said, Stephen, uh, there's two ladies that want you to pray for them. Now, I didn't know it. When Kelly was in the line, she heard two Jewish women. They're not Christian at all. They, they actually extremely turned off to Jesus. They were in the line, and they were they're elderly ladies, probably in their 80s, and they were talking to each other about how much excruciating pain they were in. One was saying, oh, my legs are killing me. The other, my back is just horrible. It's killing me. And Kelly just popped in into their conversation and said, my husband, sitting right over there at that chair, he has an international healing ministry, and if you'll go over there, he'll pray for you. And the, uh, I don't know how she said it, but she said, God will heal you or something like that. She didn't say Jesus because that would, you know, what, you know, have to be careful with that word, um, with that name. Now, she comes back with the coffees, and here they come. They saw me. Here they come. And uh, they sat down. I said, please sit down at the table. Do you need prayer? They said, yes. Uh, we're hurting. We're in tremendous pain. I said, okay, I'll pray for you, but th this is what I have to do. I have to pray in the name of Jesus. They both said, shh, don't say that name in here. You'll start a riot in here. Mm. And I, you know, okay, I, I can work with you. I said, no, but look, I said, I'll, I'll try to be as quiet as I can be. But I said, I have to pray in his name because the power is in his name. They said, okay, do what you need to do. Just keep it down. I said, okay. I said, stick your hand out. Give me your hand. The first lady puts her hand in my hand. I said, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke and curse the pain, the arthritis, and just went strong on her. Not loud, but strong prayer. And then I grabbed the other lady's hand and began to pray for her. And as I'm praying for her, she just says, oh, I'm getting so hot. And the other, the other one said, you are? Uh, she, the other one said, yes, they're having, I, I said, it's the power of God. It's the fire of God. And the other one said, I actually thought they spiked my coffee and put a bunch of alcohol in my coffee. She said, I'm burning up. And the pain just began to evaporate out of their bodies. And was that something that I wanted to do? No, I just wanted to sit there and veg out. But, but shift out of those modes, shift out of those modes when you have those opportunities. And look, after it was done, you know, they, they left. They, had, oh, they had kind of looked at their watch. Oh, we got to go catch the bus. <laughs> and they walked out like too drunk. They looked like they were drunk because the Spirit of God had touched them so strongly. Mm -mm. And there was no alcohol in the coffee. It was just straight coffee. But God hit them with the great power. Pastor Stephen, whatever happened to them? I don't know. But I'm believing that the seed sown will produce a harvest Hallelujah. They could be in heaven right now. But my friends, when we have these opportunities, go for it. Look, the rewards. 
God will always be there. If you're there for him, he'll always be there for you. Now, I, I know technically God's always there. But I'm just saying that he will do things for you that, that others may not know about. I've had the Lord do some things for me, some of them so sacred. There's very few people I could tell. I'll tell, I'll tell you one. I think I'll tell you one today. The, uh, the only person I've told this is my wife. But I'd like to tell this to you today. Last year, our dog named Duchess, who was like a saint, she lived for seven years, and for seven years, she never did one thing wrong. You think, Pastor Steve, that's not possible. It, it's true. For seven years as a dog, she never did one single thing wrong. She was like a lamb. She was so sweet. She was a mix of different breeds. And this dog was so beautiful that any time we would take her to a kennel, because, you know, we travel and things like that in ministry, any time we'd take her to a kennel, People would look at her and they would say, what kind of a dog is that? Because she was just ex extraordinarily beautiful. And one man that at the kennel who had seen every kind of dog you could think of, he said, Stephen, wow, Duchess is just the, the most beautiful dog I've ever seen. And people would say that about her. She was beautiful, but she was so sweet. Now, the way that she came into our life was that the Lord gave her to us. Kelly was working in the administration offices over in the other building here year, uh, some years back. And um, it, was, it was at nighttime. It was in the winter. It was dark and it was cold. And she hears something scratching on the door outside. And she goes to look what it is. And when she opens up the door, three little abandoned puppies ran in. They're all sisters. And immediately, Kelly looked at the one that was named, we named Duchess. Abigail named her Duchess, and we liked the name, so the name stuck. We looked at her and said, wow, this is, this is something special. So Duchess jumped up in Kelly's lap, and we refused to come down. And so the two other puppies, the sisters, we sent them to the kennel so somebody could adopt them. But Duchess was so sweet, and she became knitted and connected to Kelly. And was uh, just for seven years, absolute total joy. So that this dog actually came to the church and ran into the church on a cold night and was rescued. And for those of you that have experienced this, you'll notice that the rescue animals, they are thankful. They know, hey, you saved me. You, you rescued me. And this dog was very aware of that. And she was so sweet. And for seven years... She was an absolute delight and joy, and she was a beautiful dog. And, you know, I'd, I'd take her in the truck with me all over the place, and Kelly would take her places. She was with us all the time, and uh, so she was absolutely, really just sent from the Lord. Well, last year, we noticed that suddenly her vitality just plummeted, and she couldn't move. She became very lethargic. We took her to the vet, and the, the report came back. It shocked us. The vet says she has cancer in the brain, and it was very advanced. And I prayed for her, but the Lord said, Stephen, she has lived her life and served her purpose. The Lord said, let me bring her home. I said, oh, God, please heal her. Lord, you can heal her. The Lord said, but her time is complete. Let her come home. And the Lord said, she's in pain. Let her come home. So she was in great duress. The pain became extraordinary. So we had her put to sleep. And when she was put to sleep, we saw she's laying there with no life. It hit me and Kelly hard, like a family member. She was so sweet, and she was uh, such a blessing. It brought us so much joy. And it was very, very difficult. And Kelly just, uh, she, Kelly was just wiped out for a couple of days. And she, Kelly said, now, Stephen, the Lord has taken you to heaven before, and you've seen Tabitha. Stephen, please. 
She said, you have that ability to get in the spirit and see things. Please find out about Duchess. I said, Kelly, I already know she's in heaven. But Kelly said, I know she is, but I just, I, I want to know, though. I want to know that she's there. And so for two days I prayed. But I, my heart was so heavy, too. My heart was broken. I said, God, I didn't know I could, I could love a pet like that so much. And th this, this is something, Lord, that has really touched my heart. And she's not here anymore. She's gone. And so I came into the sanctuary, this very sanctuary that I'm preaching to you from. I came into here one day last year with my heart broken. And I said, Lord, I know that if I praise you, I believe it'll help me feel better. And I began to sing praises to the Lord. And after about 20 minutes of endeavoring to sing praises to the Lord, I stopped. I said, Lord, I said, my heart is so broken. I can't, I can't even praise you. I want to, but I said, I'm too, I'm too low right now. I said, Lord, sometimes life can be very difficult in the sense that, I, that it's almost like I'd rather go home with you as to face some of the things that can cause such pain and sorrow in life. And I said, Lord, I said, I can't praise you. I said, I do praise you. I do love you, but I can't, I can't, I said, I'm so low right now. I can't get, I can't lift myself to do it, to praise you. And I said, Lord, I'm just going to go outside and get some fresh air. So I walked out of the sanctuary here, went through the door over here, and then went out the door and went out to the parking lot. Now, Kelly was in the administration office working, not really getting any work done because she's too sad. But I went out into the parking lot, and I just said, God, I love you. I said, I know she's in heaven. I said, I know she's there. And I looked up, and I saw a cloud. And I didn't have my phone. I always have my phone. And I had left my phone in here, but I believe it was the Lord, because he didn't want me to capture what I saw. He didn't want, he, want, he doesn't mind if I share it, but he didn't want me to, it, it was too sacred. I looked up, and there was a cloud, a big cloud right over the church parking lot and nobody's out nobody's seen it and the face of Jesus was in the crowd and he was looking down at me and the face was Christ on the cross crucified the grief and the sin bearer of humanity and I saw the face of Jesus pastor Stephen what did it look like it looked like a man in the most excruciating pain and agony beyond anything I've ever seen anybody in. <sighs> Let me see if I can give you a verse that will help you to understand it. This would be 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let me share it more fully. Verse 23, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, then he said, Paul said, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. When you take communion, when you receive the flesh and the blood of Christ, you're not proclaiming his life. You're not proclaiming his resurrection. You're not proclaiming that he ascended to the right hand of the Father. You're proclaiming his death. Why, Pastor Stephen? Because it was on that cross that he became the bearer of all of the sins of humanity. And he was in total, complete agony. Don't see Christ on the cross 
as the symbol of beauty. Don't see it when you take communion. You're not looking at the beauty of the Lord. You're looking at the death and the agony of the Lord. Why? It's because that he did that, that we have life. In other words, every pain that humanity has ever felt from the first human throughout history to the generation living right now, to those that would be born today or tomorrow that would grow up and feel pain or feel the awful effects of sin and death and the curse that have been released into the earth. You have to understand that in one moment, all of that filth and pain and terror were placed and funneled on Christ all at one time. When you take communion, you see Jesus as the sin bearer. And so he bore all of our sins. And let me just be honest. He bore all of the nasty ones too. Not just the little ones that we would think, oh, that's not a big deal. Okay. He bore all sin. The worship of Satan. Murder. Abortion. The most vile sins. Cursing and just the most awful things, all of it in one, moment, in one moment of time was placed on him. He became the absolute dregs of filth and scum. And God put it all on him. And he was smitten with the curse. And the Father turned his back on him because our sin was placed on him. And Christ cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's because he became filthy. And yes, our sins were put on him, but also all of our griefs and pains, he bore them. And when I looked up at the cloud, he sucked out of me all of the grief, all of the agony of the, lo of the loss of of something that's precious that you love. He sucked it out of me. And I could tell that at Calvary. It went into him. And that's what I was looking at. And I had never seen a face so contorted. And so much pain in all of my life. It even says in scripture. That when he was on the cross. He became unrecognizable. That's what it says in Isaiah 53. 53 and Psalm 22. He, he became unrecognizable unrecognizable he didn't even look human why because of the agony that he was in and the filth that was upon him and it it caused his whole face to contort hmm. he looked like he was in so much pain and sorrow and but when I saw him in the cloud looking at me knowing I was hurting he was conveying to me I went to the cross to take your grief now let me take it and he sucked it out of me oh Oh, and the cloud's still there. Now I feel like, I feel, I feel peace. And I started to run to the administrative office to get Kelly. And the whole time I was running, I sensed the Holy Spirit saying, it's just for you. Now, why does that happen? I don't know. I don't try to figure that out. I've had experiences like that before when I knew the Spirit of God was saying, it's, don't holler. Don't take a picture. The, 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 don't tell him this is just for you. And the whole time I'm trying to run because I want her to feel the relief, to see the, the, the cloud, the face of Christ. The whole time I'm running, I knew I was running, not in the spirit, but in the flesh. And the cloud's starting to break up. And I was like, Lord, hold, hold, hold that for a moment. Kelly needs that. But the Holy Spirit let me know that he would minister to her in the way that he chose. But he was ministering to me in the way that the Savior had chosen and by the time I did get to the door and said, Kelly, please come quick, come quick. She said, what is it? What's wrong? I said, come look at Christ looking at, at, in, in the cloud. And she got out. She said, oh, my Lord. And it was beginning to quickly break up. She said, it's the Lord. I said, yes, but it was already dissolving so fast that she couldn't, she couldn't get the uh, impact of what I had received. But I did get it. And I got the full blast of it. Mm. And every time we take communion, I want you to see that we are proclaiming the Lord's death till he comes. And the more you die in him 
and connect with his death. The more of his life. Now that's the resurrection power flows into you. Hallelujah. And I would just say that there are many things that are by grace and by grace alone. But there are other things that God will do for you when you walk with him that others, they don't even know it's possible. They don't even know that God would meet you in such a way like that. But oh, yes, he will. And a whole lot more. And a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus. And that's just one of the stories. There's some other things I could share, but some of the things are very, very intimate as well. So some things I can't share. But this one I feel the peace of God to talk about. Yes, you're, if you want your pet to be in heaven, <laughs> that little furry fellow will be there. Hallelujah. Cat, dog, whatever it is. Hallelujah. Mm -mm. Heaven is beyond your wildest dreams of every beautiful, perfect, holy thing. And there's no fear. There's no sin. There's nothing that could hurt or harm anywhere in all of heaven. It's, it's just amazing. Praise God. I want you to live for him while you're here. He's going to bless you here. He's going to bless you so much that that scripture of Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, the good plan he's got for your life, you will taste that to the maximum. Mm. Yes. Hallelujah. Praise God. And when you go home to be with the Lord, you will go home. You will receive a glorious welcome and there will be rewards for you. Hallelujah. Praise God. But my friends, we must live for the Lord now. And he's going to reward you now and in the here, hereafter. If you're watching me right now and you're listening to this message and you say, well, Pastor Stephen, I don't know the Lord. I don't know the Lord. Well, you can receive him right now. And he's ready right now to wash all of your sins away. And he wants you to come to him and he's going to fix your problems and he'll make your life beautiful. Pastor Stephen, I have, I, I, I do belong to the Lord, but I'm having memory. I, I take communion, but I, I still have memory of all of my sins and it haunts me. It's, it doesn't matter if you still remember it. It has no power. It's nothing but burnt ashes. You may have a memory but it doesn't even affect your conscience. Why? It's just, all, it's just a burned out shell. It's nothing but ashes. Your sins are gone. Burned up. They were all put on Christ. Now. Numbers 19 talks about the sacrifice of the red heifer. It was burned completely. I mean, the only thing left was ashes. And the priest would take the ashes, mix it with a little bit of water, and just the ashes of a heifer, of a cow. I mean, I, I grew up with cows. We had heifers, would you believe, of all cows. We had heifers, Jersey cows, and some Brahma bulls. Okay, now, just a sprinkling of the ashes with that water made, made the people clean. And Paul in Hebrews chapter 9 said, hey, if the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on a person under the old covenant made them clean and covered their sins for another whole year, how much more the blood of Christ is able to just wash it all away, to remove it completely. Hebrews 9 verse 13, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, that would be the red heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. When that red heifer was burnt, it was nothing left but ashes. And it's a symbol of Christ. The sacrifice of God given as a substitute for our sins, completely consumed, stricken with the wrath of God, just like the heifer burnt up. 
And so all of our sins on him burned up. They're gone. Your sins that you've confessed before the Lord, there's nothing left of them. God doesn't even remember them. There's, they're nothing but ashes. And you may remember what they are, but God doesn't. But even if you remember, st still, they're just ashes. Powerless against you. There's no power in it all. Your conscience is clean. It's nothing but ashes. Praise God. If you would like to receive Jesus, who is able to wash all of your sins away, if you would like to make him your Lord and Savior, right now pray this out loud. Pray it after me. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. Wash all of my sins away. I give my life to you right now. Save me now, Jesus. Thank you. Jesus, write my name in your book of life. I want to go to heaven with you. In your name I pray. Amen. And amen. And he has heard that prayer, and he has saved your soul. You now belong to him. Now serve him and live for him for the rest of your life. Praise God forever. Let us take Holy Communion. Please grab some unleavened bread and some grape juice. And let's pray over it. Father, we thank you for the bread, the juice. We consecrate it and set it apart as holy. And we thank you that your life is in it. This is now the flesh of Jesus and his blood. Oh, Lord, we give you praise. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father, that Jesus is our atoning sacrifice. Hallelujah. And all of our sins are washed away. Father, as we receive the flesh of Jesus, let us be mindful of others, their hurts, their pains, and let us reach out by your grace and your love to minister to literally a hurting, lost, and dying world. Lord, we thank you that you're going to allow us to bring many in, into your kingdom because your anointing is upon us, and we're going to bring them in wherever we're at. We're going to bring them in. Thank you, Lord. And there's many. They're wanting. They're, the fish are wanting to jump into the boat just about. We thank you, Lord, that it's a new season, and they want to get. They, they want it. They want it. So, Father, we give you praise. We thank you for rewards, and we thank you that we do it out of love. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Let us receive the body of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Woo! Father, thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for our inheritance. Being able to come into the very throne room of grace and to receive help in time of need and answers to prayer. Thank you, O oh God, that you are answering prayers right now. Hallelujah. Let the Lord know what you need. Let him know what you need. He's going to work it all out for you. He cares for you more than you know. And his angels are with you right now. Father, we thank you that everything is going to be good. 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 Because you love us so much. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's receive the blood of Christ our Savior. Praise God. Praise God forever. Woohoo! Glory. 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 Open your heart to receive the supernatural visitations and experiences with the Lord. Don't seek after an angel, but should one come, open your heart to receive the message. Open your heart to receive supernatural experiences with the Lord. Hallelujah. It is your inheritance in Christ. Receive what Jesus has purchased for you. Receive healing. Receive deliverance for your mind right now in the name of the Lord. Somebody is being set free in their mind. Lord, we give you praise.
Lord, we give you praise. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. And the presence of the Lord is with you right now as well. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The embrace of the Lord is with you right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Spend time with him. The rewards will be showing up all around your life. Hallelujah. And the blessing of the Lord will be heavy on you. Praise God. Father, bless your people. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you for watching. Look forward to seeing you back next time. Bye-bye.